it really does flow quite nicely into the presentation coming up from Anna. Um, and I know that um, we, we often focus on kind of the big uh, emergencies of Cox Bazaar and of um, Nigeria and Syria and South Sudan and things. And yet um, a kind of lesser focused on question among all of us is really the refugees and migrants coming from Venezuela and the 17 different countries that are involved in what is known as the RV4 coordination platform. And so Anna, I'm wondering if you are online and can put up your presentation. Hi, Jen, I am online, but um, it's, you there. Hi. it's not letting me share. Do I have hosting privileges? You will be shortly granted those Perfect. privileges. Let's Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. I... Ugh, one second. Seems like Zoom is giving me a couple questions here. Oh, for some reason, it is not letting me share screen, but I did. Um, I know that we always have plan B. Uh, I, I, I downloaded your presentation so I can Perfect. share it for you. Just give me one second and I will put it up. Perfect. Thank you. I'm glad I did that last night. <laughs> Technical difficulties always arise. They always, they always do. So no worries. We have. So you should be able to see the presentation now, I hope. And just go ahead and let me know when you'd like me to advance. Perfect. Thank you. Um, hola, colegas. Uh, my name is Anna Verbecki. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be able to take part in this. So I have been working on developing a guide and toolkit on collective shelter management under the shelter sector in the R4V platform in Venezuela, or for Venezuela refugees and migrants in Latin America and the Caribbean. So the overall purpose of this guide is to serve as a tool to harmonize approaches on collective shelter management between all the partners operating under the R4V platform, specifically within the shelter sector, which is a lot. And so I'm gonna give a bit of context for what this R4V platform really is on the next couple slides. Go ahead and change if you can, Jen. Perfect. So to start, I'm gonna provide a little bit of a background on the Venezuela situation. So Venezuela has been on the grip of an economic crisis for years and lack of investment in infrastructure further exacerbated by the more recent sanctions on Venezuela's oil sector have crippled this key industry, which provides almost all of Venezuela's governmental revenue. With the combination of the political human rights and socioeconomic developments in Venezuela, this has actually led to the largest movement of refugees and migrants in the recent history of Latin America and the Caribbean. And as of November last year, there are approximately 5.4 million refugees and migrants from Venezuela outside their country of origin. 4.6 million are residing within the region and approximately 1 million are with irregular status. Go ahead for the next slide. So what is the R4V? Um, when I first started, I was very confused and it took me a couple, probably about a month to actually understand the entire way that the platform functions because it's very unique in nature. In April, 2018, the UN Secretary General tasked UNHCR and IOM with establishing a regional interagency platform for refugees and migrants from Venezuela to lead and coordinate the entire response. And then with that, the R4V regional platform was created. So it reflects a sectoral structural response aimed at coordinating the interventions of the Venezuela situation to complement efforts of national and local government. And its primary objective is to harmonize approaches, 
coordination and implementing activities under the Refugee Migrant Response Plan, which is known as the JRP in a lot of other contexts. For most of us in the field, to make it easier, R4V is very similar to how OCHA functions. So it's a coordination platform and is not um, actually implementing in the field itself. That's where the implementing partners come in. And it includes 259 implementing partners. So to my knowledge, from my experience, I do believe this is probably one of the largest coordinating platforms um, that I've seen in my experience. But um, it also includes 17 different countries across the region. And I've listed the countries there. So it includes Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Aruba, Curaçao, the DR, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Panama, Costa Rica, Mexico, Argentina, Uruguay, Bolivia, and Paraguay. So 17 different countries, which is a lot to coordinate. Uh, go ahead for the next slide. So this is to give you a visual representation of the region. Everything that actually is colored in blue is a part of the platform and the countries that are included in this um, coordination mechanism. Every country has a different number, hosts a different number of Venezuelan refugees. And the largest numbers are residing in Colombia and Peru. The actual, this map actually is um, budget request and that's the different shades, but you can see that the Colombia and Peru are the darkest because they host the largest number of refugees and migrants from Venezuela, therefore would require more resources. But this is just to give an overall representation of how large and vast this entire response is and how, how, much, um, how much work it is to also be able to coordinate across three or four different time zones, different languages, and um, it's very unique in nature. Next slide, please. So these are the different sectors that operate within the R4V platform. You can see that there is no CCCM sector in the platform structure. Camps are very political in many regions of the world, but especially in Latin America and Caribbean. So a lot of the cross-cutting and multi-sectoral elements of camp management are integrated into all these different sectors, but they have the strongest overlap in the shelter sector because of the, um, the majority of shelters in Latin America and Caribbean are collective shelters, which has a lot of overlap with the multi-sectoral response of camp management. Next slide, please. So this guide encompasses the versatile context of many different collective shelter types, primarily in urban, but also rural contexts. And each of the 17 different countries operates under different governmental policies, regulations, priorities, and every country also has different types of sites, which are considered collective shelters, which are included in, um, in consideration into this guide. Just as an example, in the northern state of Roraima, Brazil, close to Boavista, and in the border towns closer to Venezuela, the shelter context there is actually much more similar to what I think a majority of us on this call would be familiar with, more displacement type of sites. And you'll see some photos on the next few slides to make the distinctions. And a variety of facilities are considered of use as collective shelters under the overarching theme. Community centers, warehouses, hotels, stadiums, gymnasiums, unfinished buildings, or unused factories. These are structures that are normally used in urban context and normally pre-existing, but not always. Next slide, please. So this depicts the various coverage of what is considered shelter within this context. The photo on the left is an example of a collective shelter commonly used in Latin America and Caribbean. Unused buildings to host people who are on the move. Sometimes people stay for longer periods of time. And the photo on the right is actually in Roraima State in Northern Brazil, what I was just discussing. So you can see the stark contrast between what is considered shelter under this context and this guide aims to create tools and resources catered specifically for the unique region of Latin America to highlight practical lessons learned between the 17 different countries operating in very different contexts 
and by different organizations, many of which are religious organizations. And another element of this project has been to provide ways and mechanisms to integrate CCCM, the social aspects, the community-led approaches and participation to a very transitory context. As I mentioned before, people are not spending long in these facilities. Sometimes it can be two, three days. Sometimes it can be longer because of the necessary lockdowns in between countries. But many of them are also walking there. They are not arriving by any coordinated transport. They're coming on foot. And so this aims to provide ways to integrate the CCCM people-centered approach in a very short-term transitory way. Next slide. So the most practical components of this guide are, and my favorite part specifically, are the SOP sections, which includes practical tools, examples, best practices, and recommendations for how to integrate CCCM concepts, uphold minimum standards, and integrate those people-centered approach uh, to the unique region of Latin America and Caribbean. But because I only have 30 minutes, this is going to be a very summarized and condensed version. But I'm going to highlight the five main sections of the SOPs, which you can see on the slide, and some best practices that I think other practitioners in this call could actually benefit from. So how the SOP sections are organized are, which should be familiar to many of you, it's very similar to a lot of the guidance that exists. Um, First is collective shelter reception and, and management. So this is really the opening and setting up all the things to consider in that process. Uh, next is community participation and representation. Next is coordination, service monitoring, information management, and maintenance and rehabilitation. Strategic exit planning, and then finally transitional and durable solutions. Next slide. The first, um, this is the opening the prep of setting up a collective shelter and necessary considerations. Next. As a part of the setup process, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to highlight um, some specific protection considerations in practice that came out of a lot of these, uh, the consultations that were done and discussed with partners in the region for when uh, setting up and establishing a collective shelter. Next slide. So during the opening processes, first thing that should be done is a mapping of other existing shelters in the area, but more importantly, clarifying at the beginning what type of people the new shelter will receive. For example, will it be unaccompanied asylum-seeking children? Will it be GBV survivors, trafficking victims, or specifically an example, um, LGBTQI? In case these specialized shelters do exist in the area, Referrals should be coordinated with authorities and protection partners on the ground. And if it is decided that a specific shelter is going to cater to a specific group, establishing a vulnerability index and criteria for access enhances protection of the people residing in these spaces. For example, a shelter hosting only LGBTQ persons may not be open to hosting other people with special needs or without special needs because of the stigma this could entail and uh, exacerbating protection concerns. Another uh, protection consideration that came out of these consultations is to ensure that there are both sex segregated sanitary facilities, but also general neutral sanitary facilities with lockable doors from the inside and ensuring accessibility of communal services for persons with disabilities. Next slide. So these are the the sections that I think are the most interesting, the experiences from the region where we can actually draw the best practices of what implementing partners are doing on the ground. So planning is a process that must be started before the response and developing scenarios and forecasting resources saves time and provides a lot of clarity about roles and actors involved in the process. In Ecuador, in a temporary accommodation center on the border with Peru, uh, they had conducted a, with the national government, a database of land infrastructure classified by its suitability. So there were three categories considered suitable, not suitable, and subject to recommendation. And this classification corresponded to different potential disaster scenarios to have plans 
ahead and kind of speed up the bureaucratic processes to ensure that if something did happen and they did need land in order to construct a temporary accommodation center, they were able to do that in a very streamlined manner because the government was already involved. They already had a list of land and specific areas that were considered suitable. So they didn't have to go through those bureaucratic hindrances. And this was something that they update regularly. So this is just an example of one good practice to highlight how preparation during the planning processes can reduce headaches for everyone and make responses much easier to eliminate necessary, unnecessary bottlenecks and bureaucratic hurdles. Next slide. Next, we'll talk briefly on community participation and representation in Latin America. Many people I think are familiar with establishing a normal CCCM response. I say normal, but there's really no normal CCCM response because everyone is so different. But um, one common theme is establishing committees and representation of governance structures, which is usually meant for people who are residing in a specific place for an extended period of time. And in this context, we don't necessarily have that same um, luxury of establishing governance structures, but there's many other ways to include and engage the population. So other ideas and recommendations have been established to increase participation, increase ownership, um, because many people are only spending two, three nights a week, uh, two, three nights a week um, in a specific location because they're, they're on the move. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, this context is extremely transitory and doesn't give the type of longer term participation that occurs in many other displacement contexts. Therefore, um, this table kind of highlights some suggestions and ways to integrate participation in a very transitory context. So three steps to do this are um, integrating participation, providing information and two-way feedback mechanisms. And from consultations and what practitioners are doing in the field, um, one thing that was very unique was integrating participation, creating rules and regulations for a common space, as many of these collective shelters people are sharing, not only rooms sometimes, but also all the common facilities, so bathrooms, um, laundry areas, kitchens, things like that. And in the onset of establishing that, the community should take part in establishing what sort of rules and respect, what boundaries exist, um, that they can have equal respect for one another's space and making them a part of that process and then posting it around the shelter to make it visible and then validate the community's priorities. Um, another way, uh, providing information, posting a map of the local area. As mentioned, many of these people are on the move, so they're not familiar and they're constantly moving. And a lot of times, People will get confused moving between different cities, different countries. Sometimes they all start to look the same. And posting a map of the local area where important locations can be identified, health services, support centers, is really pivotal in this process with people constantly changing their, um, their location. And then lastly, um, a way to integrate kind of a CFM mechanism is just having some sort of basic rating system regarding services, cleanliness, um, a basic questionnaire that people can, can actually act upon upon their exit, leaving a collective site. Next slide, please. This is just an example of uh, different categories to consider for the shared living space regulation. So organized by different categories, obviously this is just one example, but um, one example is under co-living space, not consuming alcohol because it's not only can increase protection by keeping substances out of reach of children, but it also can reduce the potential for domestic violence based on substance abuse and help actually keep the places cleaner with less trash. Next slide. Um, and this is an example from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. So social media networks are used to disseminate important information to beneficiaries around the island. Primarily, this is done through WhatsApp messaging, through creation of broadcast listings according to the beneficiary's classification for protection purposes. For example, some broadcasts are only sent to people who have been identified as victims of trafficking, 
And if needed, they can be sent to refugees and migrants under other lists of vulnerability if it's a message that concerns him or her. The beneficiaries are actually free to respond directly to these messages to ensure they have any issues clarified and receive frequent updates given the changes of their situation. And this has been extremely helpful during COVID response with the increased restrictions and lockdown measures. Examples of some of this information includes monthly NFI distributions, invitation to participate in focus group discussions, information on upcoming vocational courses to learn English as a second language. And in places where there's low connectivity and network issues, organizations are actually putting the same information on posters to share with partners and community-based organizations, community organizations to ensure that um, beneficiaries are reached, even those without connectivity access. Next slide, please. So now we're moving towards the second half of the SOPs, which is coordination and monitoring of services, management of information, and maintenance uh, and maintenance and rehabilitation of collective shelters. Next slide. So with coordination, this is kind of a should include and what should the inclusion actually achieve. So coordination of actual managers of collective sites should include municipal governments, property owners and neighbors, host communities, and refugees and migrants to achieve linkages of support networks, providing information so refugees and migrants can make better and informed decisions to uphold minimum standards and also to support advocacy to find durable solutions. So if someone is traveling on foot from, for example, Cucuta in Colombia, to Bucaramanga in Colombia, it will take approximately seven to 10 days to do that on foot. And generally the route that he or she will take is the same as other refugees and migrants have taken before. And there are shelters and support centers along the way. And these networks should be communicating with each other to establish and estimate availability, population flows and emergency needs if, if there is a health emergency of someone who just departed from a, from a specific area and on their way to the next one. Next slide, please. Highlighting experience from the region in Aruba, during the COVID pandemic, through the support of coordination and information sharing, women beneficiaries actually organized amongst themselves to make food and sell it on Facebook and WhatsApp groups amongst their friends and acquaintances as a method of income generation. In one example, a group of women created a business operating structure where one woman was cooking and she hired five of her friends to actually sell the food that she prepared. And it was a female business network. Through coordination with one another, word of mouth, use of social networks, and using each other as a network to expand their clientele, this not only amplified their sales and income generation, but it also promoted empowerment and community ownership and initiatives, which reduces dependency on humanitarian aid and uh, civil society organizations. Next slide, please. Um, another example to link maintenance and rehabilitation with community engagement comes from experience in Ecuador. So support with maintenance tasks of a collective shelter should wherever possible involve those living within the space and the host community according to capacities. People residing in and around the collective shelter are usually well acquainted with how the facility actually operates and this provides an asset to doing the job effectively, community, promoting community engagement, ownership, and also having pride for having input in the decisions one, um, in the place one is living. In Ecuador, some organizations managing collective shelters actually engage the beneficiaries in the space to work together to restore donated furniture to improve the rooms and living conditions. They also hired some host community populations to undertake more technical tasks, including renovating and restoring donated computers for education use. Not only did this reduce tensions between the host community members and the refugee and migrant population, but it also created an environment of co-responsibility. This promoted peaceful coexistence between community populations and also instilled a sense of pride and ownership for the beneficiaries able to take part in small renovations of furniture and materials where they lived. Next slide, please. And strategic exit planning, <laughs> next slide. 
So I'm really glad that I actually followed Alex because he talked about um, a lot of specific guidance that's been developed for avoiding evictions, which has been a common theme of um, a need of the shelter sector in the R4V platform to develop more guidance specifically on this. And the protection sector actually did create a guidance recently that was published, I believe in um, May of this year in the R4V platform on how to avoid evictions that was taken from a lot of the global guidance that was already released and established, I think in November, near the end of last year on the HLP and the protection cluster. So protection against evictions is obviously especially important during the context of COVID-19 and the R4V crisis in the region to avoid vulnerable populations living on the streets, both perpetuating a larger humanitarian crisis as well as health crisis with the risk of exposure, higher risk of exposure and contracting and transmitting COVID-19. Oftentimes agencies offer rental assistance, cash for rent, which has been a best practice in the region um, based on established criteria in order to support populations in transition from a collective shelter into a more individual rented housing option and preventing evictions. So some examples of support for avoiding these uh, avoiding evictions are support cash for rent assistance, coaching beneficiaries on negotiating fair housing agreements so that they are not taken advantage of, whether that's whether that's being a language barrier or just um, just don't have experience actually negotiating what is fair and what's unfair in a contract. Another um, example after changing residence beneficiaries, a criteria is after changing your residence, Beneficiaries are assisted by protection actors and a way to support is changing any civil documentation to the new address. So if people need to be contacted, they can ensure that they're getting the information at their new, new address and connecting to resources, legal resources, especially um, if they are linked to previous residences. Next slide. And finally, durable solutions. Next slide, please. As a part of strategic exit strategy, um, it also includes durable solutions. According to the durable solutions framework, these can be achieved through three different mechanisms, return or repatriation, which is sustainable reintegration at the place of origin, in this case, Venezuela. Local integration, which is sustainable local integration into the host community or resettlement, which is sustainable integration in another part of the host country. And just to give an example, on February 8th, 2021, Colombia provided a 10-year temporary protection status to the 1.7 million, million Venezuelan refugees who reside in the country. And Colombia actually hosts the largest number of Venezuelan refugees and migrants. This new temporary protection statute will make Venezuelan migrants who are in Colombia legally eligible for 10-year residence permit. The temporary protection status provides access to basic services, including the national healthcare system and COVID-19 vaccination plans. Regularization is also a key to long-term solutions, including access to the job market, enabling them to work legally, which in turn serves to lessen the dependency of people on humanitarian systems while also contributing to the country's post-19 socioeconomic recovery. So this was just a very great example of um, Colombia's acceptance of regularizing the 1.7 million refugees into the country to make them eligible for work and also um, vaccinations in the midst of the global pandemic. And that, I think we are on to the next slide. I think that about covers that. So thank you. I know I talked quite fast. It was a lot to cover. Um, and sorry that my, my video is not working, but you know, I don't look great anyway. So uh, it's a bit early over here in Latin America. So I think that it's worked to my benefit. So I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. And um, I think I have a much better understanding of the, the platform than I have be, before, even though we've been talking about it for some time. Um, I see a, a question here um, from, from Omar asking about the information management tools that they're using there to connect um, those 17 different countries and 200 plus partners. Can you elaborate a little bit on that for the? Yes, 
for the yes, question? I would be happy to. So there is um, quite an extensive team of I am uh, personnel between several different organizations. And from what I have seen, because I think there's a whole nother plethora of things that in the I am world that I don't understand, um, but they do at this point, they have the R4V info website, which actually gives an overall map. I can, I'll link that in here um, after my presentation, but it gives an overall map of different support spaces, shelters, and who's, who's actually managing them within the region. But all of that is actually entered into Excel. So, and in terms of the coordination um, that they have for, you know, reporting on rec regular activities and things like that, it's it's very similar to a normal 4W type of, of tool. I have in the toolkit, which will be published very soon, I have a very basic draft of a, of a 4W um, response example, but that it actually is a very good point. I'll try to try to get a better understanding of to what the IM team, how they actually manage all of this data. But I do know from my conversations with them, it's all these formulas and things that are populated onto a map uh, within a whole world that I don't really understand, but uh, they do an amazing job. But they, they actually, they make it a lot more accessible um, to people like me who are not so ingrained into Excel to actually see in a specific country where specific shelters exist, where specific healthcare facilities exist, and all of this is publicly available. So I'll link the site into this chat shortly. Thanks a lot for that. So we we have um, finished the last um, presentation for this segment, and I just really want to thank all of the presenters, Kelly, George, Phil, Daniela, Jim, Liz twice, Shane, Chuck, Alex, Anna, um, you've really kind of brought us together and, and touched upon themes of um, shelter and settlements and then the, the use of standards and fire safety, as well as um, contexts that we infrequently think about. Um, you know, the advantages of having minimum standards, I think, and, and working so closely with the shelter sector, I think have been um, very much highlighted in this session. So I thank all of you for your excellent thoughts and, and helping us to um, learn more about the work that you've been doing.